Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books is pleased to host a program with best-selling New York Times author Richard Florida, author of The Rise of the Creative Class and The New Urban Crisis. He is in conversation with Michigan Radio's Zoe Clark. During 2021, more than half of the 20 largest American metro areas lost residents. It was the pandemic, and people fled from the most densely populated urban areas, and the popularity of remote work grew. Well, last year, according to estimates by the U.S. Census, metropolitan areas in Texas and Florida grew, and New York and Los Angeles declines were reduced by 50%. But what is happening in cities now as life resumes to a new normal? Today's conversation features Richard Florida to answer some of those questions and to discuss the importance of cities today. Let's meet our guests. Richard Florida is a researcher, professor, entrepreneur, writer, and journalist. He is the co-founder of City Lab, as well as the founder of Creative Class Group. We are honored to have Richard Florida on the show today, and he is in conversation with moderator Zoe Clark, the interim general manager and political director for Michigan Radio, as well as the co-host for It's Just Politics. Welcome, Zoe. I look forward to hearing the conversation. Thank you so much, Heather. Hi, Richard Florida. Hey, Zoe. How are you? It's good to see I'm you again. Good. It's so good to see you again. So let's just do some level setting here. Your name has really become synonymous with this word urbanist. And I'm just fascinating. Like, what does that mean to you? And and I'm fascinated by it, but but what fascinates you about cities? Well, you know, this goes a long way back. So I was born in Newark a long, long time ago. And when I was a little boy, Newark was a spectacular city, much like Detroit or Cleveland. Or, you know, my parents lived in this, I'm Italian-American, this Italian-American neighborhood. All of our relatives lived there. There was an incredible shopping district the Kresge's and the Bambergers and all these independent stores and restaurants. And then when I was about nine or 10, something really happened. And I think this is what made me become an urbanist. Uh, about, about the summer, summertime, warm summertime, like when we're talking now, um, my dad, my uh, you see guitars behind me, folks. I want always want to be a guitar player. I like the Beatles. I like music. My dad said, if you want to play guitar, you have to take guitar lessons. And he was taking me to my guitar lesson. And we had to drive through the city of Newark. And the whole city was in flames. And there were tanks on the street. And there were National Guard soldiers. And they said the city was in riots. I, I don't like the term. I've come not to learn, like the term riots. The same thing happened in Detroit and Cleveland and Washington, D.C. and all over this country. African-American people who had felt the weight of discrimination and segregation and racism, uh, sparked by uh, instances of police brutality, uh, engaged in acts of civil disobedience. And I wanted, I guess, you know, here's a nine or 10 year old kid on his way to a guitar lesson. But I think what swirled around in my mind was, why is my city up in flames? Why are there tanks in the street? And then in the wake of that, we saw this, this movement of people and companies out of the city. So as I got older, my dad worked in a factory in downtown Newark in the Ironbound section, that factory closed. My mom worked in the local paper, the Star Ledger. There was like barbed wire and fences around it. And I went to college and I didn't know what to do with my life. I thought I'd be a guitar player, right? And my professor said, take this little map that I give you and go to New York City, because I went to Rutgers College in New Jersey, and go walk through all these neighborhoods. And I walked through Greenwich Village and Soho and Tribeca and Flatiron. And I saw a city alive with like professors and poets with berets and like hippies with long hair and punks. Which, and I couldn't believe it. And that was the day. So what it, I, I became an urbanist when cities were on the decline, right? When cities were going down, when cities were deindustrializing, when people were moving out and nobody cared. Like you're an urbanist, so big whoop. 
And then all of a sudden, as I became a professor and established my career, cities started to regenerate and revive. You know, look at what's happened in your hometown of Detroit. I mean, we could just one example. You know, that's kind of a poster child of this. But but and then any, everybody wanted to talk about cities like I, I went from having the worst job in the world to the best job in the world. But it's all because when I was a young boy, you know, something triggered in my head that that. I needed to understand why my city was in crisis, why my city was declining, and then to experience the rebirth of cities. That was kind of like a dream come true. So that's what it is. An urbanist studies cities and urban, and not just cities. You know, I think one of the big things, you know, if I were to write another book, I'd write a book on the suburbs. I think one of the big things we've seen is suburbs are becoming more urbanized and suburbs are becoming grown up. So yeah. I think urbanists not only study cities and urban centers, they study the whole ball of wax. And you wrote this sort of now infamous book, famous right. book, right. The Rise of the Creative Class. What in your mind makes a successful city? So I, I wrote many other books before I wrote Rise of the Creative Class that my mother and father and brother and good friends read. So I was prepared <laughs> for that book to be a flop. I'm really honest. On, on, and, you know, something happened, folks. And it's really interesting. This is when the internet was just growing and somebody said a blogger. I was a blogger then. I didn't even know what it was. You know, and I had a, a, a student at Carnegie Mellon, not me, a student of Carnegie Mellon who happened to be a gay man, was trying to study where gay men were located. And you, you cannot get this in the Census Bureau and statistics. So he had to create this complicated algorithm and computer program. Anyway, one day he said to me, what are your five, like, fastest growing high tech innovative cities and i said something like zoe san francisco boston seattle austin and san diego uh, uh, something like that that probably wasn't the... and he said you've just named five of the gayest cities in the country so what happened was somebody picked up on this and wrote an article titled why cities with gays and rock bands are winning the economic war that made the book a bestseller got me on the colbert report and I, look that was three pages of a 500 page book but you know how the world works right so so by the way that's not how cities you know it's one ingredient what i said was cities need to do a full package they need to invest in companies they need to invest in business they need to have strong businesses they have need to have research and development they need to have high-tech companies they need to have these clusters and networks of companies they they also need talent so that was the first one technology they also need talent they need to have these clusters of people who want to stay there and live there and move there. And I was living in Pittsburgh at a time, and I, I would always say in Pittsburgh, our biggest export, export wasn't steel. It was the talented and creative people that were coming out of our great universities. And to do that, you needed to be a tolerant and open-minded environment. You needed to be a place where women and men and boys and girls and gays and straights and ethnic mi racial minorities, everybody felt they can contribute. And when you had that mixture and you were a great place, you are a winner. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I tried to simplify it, you know, because you're not just compute, you know, you're not communicating this to other professors. Like a lot of times mayors don't have a real background or people who work in city government don't or in chambers of commerce. So I wanted to kind of level, level it up and give a simple formula. Yeah. And it took off and it at least opened a pathway for me and others to have this dialogue with great cities and communities. And I do think Zoe, and for folks listening in, I think we, and when I say we, not just me, this whole community of urbanists and people who study urban development have made a huge contribution. Like we now, when I started, we did not understand why cities grow. We did not understand what to invest in. We, now I think we have a pretty good understanding of what cities can do to improve their trajectory. I, I think the, I think there are new challenges ahead now, but I think over the past 20 years, we've, been, we've built a pretty good toolkit. So I'm pretty proud of that. I was going to say, I mean, it's it's almost sort of a roadmap, right? Um, and then comes COVID. <laughs> then comes this global pandemic that upends everything, including cities. And dramatically, in moments, it seemed like all of our lives changed and how we work in cities, how we move in cities, where we go, how we interact um, with and within cities all changed almost instantaneously. Has anything in recent memory <laughs> impacted cities? I mean, I, it, it's such a silly, it's a, such a, a small question. What has impacted more? But like, 
fundamentally, life has completely changed. And what does that look like for these organisms that are cities? So, you know, it's really interesting talking with you again and getting to know you better and, and listening to your questions, because every time you ask them, I don't think of them in the abstract. I think of them personally. <laughs> it's really, and for folks listening in or watching, I don't think of this as an abstract chessboard of studies. The first thing that comes to mind when you said that, or the question about an urbanism was me, and maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's what's happening. So look, I can cycle back to March, 2020 pretty easily. I, I don't like to, I like, I try, I'm trying to avoid it, but I could force myself to do it. And I was in a state of abject terror. And I bet most of us, I mean, I was scared to death. I have two little kids. Uh, I wanted to protect them. I didn't know what to do. And very quickly, this question of cities, no one asked it. It popped into my head. And I said, OMG, this is a big deal. And I'm completely unprepared for it. No one told me about it. No one studied it. I never read a book on a pen, on Panda. I read it. I read like a Bill Gates thing or what, a television show or a movie, but not a book about cities and pandemics. Never heard about it. Now, what gets even more interesting is, you know, I'm the product of an Italian-American family. Mom and dad both had seven, six siblings, seven kid families. My mom and dad were about the youngest in their respective families, which means all of my aunts and uncles were born and lived through the Spanish flu. Never mentioned, not once. Now, they would talk ad nauseum about the Great Depression and my dad's service in World War II, and I love to hear those stories. So quickly, I figured out I had to go back and take a look at this. So, so folks, I did this. I spent those months of the pandemic, like I had stacks of books and I would read all the research papers. And what I concluded, it was a big event, but it was a survivable event. And that what I concluded for those listening in is that the it, really interesting. This thing we call urbanization that Zoe asked me about, what is an urbanist? This thing that causes people to move off the farm into small human settlements and begin trading with one another. And then when industrialism came to build bigger cities like Detroit and Cleveland and Pittsburgh and all the ones around the world. And then now that we keep pouring into cities, even though we don't have those big factories in cities and people in Asia, and this force called urbanization is the most powerful force in human history and nothing. No infectious disease, no parasite, no plague. And going back in history, there was a bump in the road. Don't get me wrong, the bubonic plague, cholera, these were horrific by, by comparison. They were, but they were bumps in the road. I think it, it, it turned down, but it came back sweeping up. So I came to conclude that urbanization was a much stronger force. You asked what was similar. I think I know what was similar. And, and of course, we could go back to the bombings of London. We could go back to the great fires in London and New York and San Francisco. But I think the bigger event that happened in our life was deindustrialization. I think that is the biggest chance. Everything else with remote work and office work, come back to this, pales in comparison to when the cities, the, 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 the company, the factories closed up shop through people like my dad out of work, through hundreds of thousands of people across this country and millions around the world out of work. Cities used to be manufacturing. They used to be manufacturing and transport and warehousing hubs. You know, look around your city if you live in an older city. You can see the legacy of those vacant lots, those greenfield or brownfield sites. So that was a bigger shock. And we survived. If we could survive that, we'll survive this. So there's a toolbox or there was pre-COVID a toolbox for a successful city and what you needed to do. Is there a new set of tools now post-COVID where folks are leaning into remote work, changing how they think about transportation? What is that new toolbox and what cities are doing it well? So I think there's two toolboxes, one that we know well and one that we still have to develop. Um, even before the pandemic, cities around the country and the world were beginning to think about remote work. Remember, remote work was already rising, work from home before the pandemic. Now it exploded. It tripled. It went from 6% before the pandemic, this is work from home, to 18% after, although it's now coming down. And I think the expectation is it's going to settle up around 12. Um, but already cities were trying to focus on, this is the big shift we did when we talked about earlier. We shifted cities to understand the real critical thing wasn't attracting companies 
It was attracting talented and retaining talented and creative people. And what I mean by that is not just eggheads with PhDs. I mean, attracting talented people of all sorts. The reason I met, made up this measure, the creative class, is because, because most people were just counting people with a bachelor's degree. And in my mind, if I looked at great Motown musicians or producers, Barry Gordy, Smokey Robinson, my boyhood idol, Jimi Hendrix, you know, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, they all they, they didn't go to college. So I was trying to find a measure of what people do at work. And the, and the good news is 40% of us get to use our creativity at work. We're artists, designers, musicians, techies. But the other bad part is 60%. So we have to harness and get more people engaged and use more people's creativity wherever they work. Anyway. Um, we've done it. We did a good job of understanding talent was the driver and that you had to build better places. You know, you look at Traverse City, Michigan, this place in the up north part of Michigan. that has been lauded by the Brookings Institution as doing this well. The Hudson Valley of New York, Bozeman, Montana, Jackson Hole, Park City. We could go down the list of this. Um, and and Tulsa remote, you know, not just gorgeous, beautiful and menetized places. You know, Tulsa, out there in Tulsa, a city that was really whacked by the petroleum and gas crisis, created this program before the pandemic called Tulsa Remote, where they remote where they offered people a small stipend. But it wasn't the stipend that mattered. That covered their moving costs. What they did was develop a whole community so they could network people in and find them housing and build them a social network and fabric. We do all of that good. That toolbox is great. The toolbox that we don't have, or I shouldn't say we have it, we have to put it together better because we have the we have the bits of it, is how do we now deal with this crisis of affordability? How do we deal with the housing crisis of affordability? How do we deal with the growing inequity in our cities and suburbs? How do we deal with, you know, to make our urban centers, our core cities more family friendly? Now, look, there have been a lot of people smarter than me that have studied that for a long time. I, I, but I think that's really the challenge today. How how do we build that second toolbox, which is about how to build more inclusive and ex equitable and better cities for everybody? Oh, Richard, this is why I love talking to you, because, of course, you teed me up to my very next question, which is exactly about that. And almost this idea of can a city become too successful, right, <laughs> where I mean, determining how you define success but where folks who are creative are just priced out and can't live and in a city and, and feel like they are part of an inclusive place. Well, you know, I, my mentor was a woman named Jane Jacob. She's my, the person who really invented this field. She didn't have a PhD, didn't have a degree in economics and urbanism. She's just a normal lady from Scranton who moved to New York and observed the world around her, then moved to Toronto later in life. And I got to know her when I moved to Toronto. You know, she had so many great one line quotes, but the best one, because I asked her this question, she just said, well, well, Richard, you know, when a place gets boring, even the rich people leave. When a place gets boring, even the rich, you know, nobody wants to be in a boring, dull place. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I actually think the crisis of my city, Newark, or the crisis of Detroit or the crisis of New York City in the 70s and 80s, when the president Ford told him, drop dead, you're going broke, we're not going to bail you out was a crisis of failure, decline, and economic dysfunction and deindustrialization. I, I don't want to say the whole crisis of cities today. There are many cities still struggling with that terribly. But the crisis of cities today is increasingly a crisis of their own success, a crisis of gentrification, of rich people moving in, of, of you know, San Francisco. They call me up during the crisis and say, what, what can we do, Rich? And like, I don't have every answer. I'm not, I'm not you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not a clairvoyant. But I said... I, I like San Francisco. I'd probably like to live there. If a townhouse didn't cost $12 million, maybe people could live in San Francisco. And I said, maybe with the tech boom, you should just think about this, guys. Maybe with the tech boom, San Francisco became less like San Francisco. What made San Francisco great? The 60s and the music scene and the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead and that whole explosion of creativity that actually paved the way. You know, those innovators, those techies like Steve Jobs were like kind of hippies that were looking for a way to express themselves through their technologies. And I said, what if you got back to your roots and and stopped going after this gentrified, yuppified and, and tried to go back to being about music and arts? And if some storefronts are vacant, don't see that as a crisis, see that an opportunity to create art galleries and bring people back. 
So yeah, I think there's a balance in all of this, but what, what makes great cities, for sure, if I could say one thing, it's the creative energy of people, and it's not just the creative energy of tech people. It's the creative energy of all people, the local hairstylist, the local mom and pop shop, the local kid who wants to be a musician, you know. And, and the story I always tell folks, I went out to Seattle when Seattle was on its knees. This is like 25 years ago. And, and the people in Seattle were like, what can we do to rebuild our downtown? And it's in crisis. And all the high tech companies are out in the suburbs. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw this new building being built. And, and I said, what is that thing? And they said, well, that's a new thing that one of our tech leaders, Paul Allen, folks, who happens to be, he's deceased now, but he's the co-founder of Microsoft with Bill Gates and the tech whiz. Gates was the company builder, but Allen was like the, the, the guy who built the software. And I thought to myself, is that the Seattle Science Center? And I thought he's influenced by like the great scientists like I, nope, is that the great Seattle Center of Discovery? I thought it wasn't Einstein, you know, Thomas Edison or Henry Ford, this great, nope. Okay, so this guy wants to make money. It's the Seattle Center for Entrepreneurship. He wants to be like a business leader. Nope. It's the Jimi Hendrix Experience Music Project. The person who inspired Paul Allen wasn't a scientist or an engineer or an entrepreneur. This guy who became probably the most successful, one of the most successful technology builders of our time. It was a young African-American kid from his hometown, Jimi Hendrix, who, who created not only with his hands, but with effects, pedals and amplification and studio effects created whole new ways of hearing guitar. And that, like, that's the point. It, it, it's not like the techie begets the techie and you want to invest just in geeky. So, you know, a city is a creative cauldron of everyone. And great cities make arts and culture and music and technology and do it all. And that's what I sometimes think we forget in this. Like, OK, we want like a perfect city, a cleaner city. You know, a city which doesn't have any grit or grime. Not, not you know, but but uh, I had two guests. I teach an MBA class in this. And I teach kids how to pick cities and what to do. And one guest who's amazing from Austin, Texas, he said, sometimes the most creative ideas come out of like friction and come out of this, like it, they don't just resistance, like maybe my Newark or the 60s. Like they, they come out of this tension. They don't just come out of like the perfect life. So cities that have friction, that have chaos, that have resistance, that have diversity, that's where you're going to get it. And we shouldn't try to flatten that out. We should let our cities grow up and do those kinds of things. And it's why cities have personalities and are different because they're not all vanilla. They're not all just choosing one way to be. No. And I think, you know, some people get scared mm -hmm. and they get scared of that and they retreat. And, you know, we have seen this sorting you know, where people are choosing the places they feel comfortable. And during COVID, I think people were really scared of the virus and they went to more. And, that, that you know, the good thing is they went out to rural areas and they made them more interesting places. But I think for a lot of people, if given the choice, they like diversity. They like to expose their kids. Like, I think about my neighborhood. If you if you were to look out my window here, the people, but you can't because we're on the, the computer screen. Um, my neighborhood which was not diverse when we moved into it 15 years ago, which was, I mean, I'm Italian. My wife's from Michigan. She's Jordanian. We were the only two, probably only two ethnic people. You know, now this neighborhood, I have Chinese families on this side. I have Persian families on this side. I have Indian families on this side. And we live in Toronto. And, and I think one of the things that's so interesting, especially for an American audience, I'm an American, <laughs> um, but I live in Toronto, is that Toronto has a couple of things which are different. And I just want, this is really important. As expensive as it is and all of the issues that it has, it has provincially funded schools, which would be the equivalent of state funded schools. That means every school is good. That means my kids can go to a good school, but a Filipina single mom housekeeper, who we know, her kids can go to a good school and her kids get to go to the University of Toronto, just like my kids could. There is... They're guns. Don't get me wrong. People in Canada can have a gun and go hunting, but you can't walk around with one of them in your belt and you can't go down the street with it. People, I mean, there is violent crime in Toronto. I don't mean to say there's not, but not in anywhere near. Kids ride their bikes. Kids take the subway. It, there is a safety net. Health, everyone has health care. 
I'm not trying to say this is nirvana, but suffice to say that you can have a city which is diverse and safe and where kids of different ethnicities can get to know one another and live close. Yes, of course, there are richer and poorer neighborhoods. Toronto's not perfect, but I think if you walk around London or Paris or Toronto, you see a different thing. And I think we've cheated ourselves. I'm being honest with you. I think we've cheated ourselves. And in America, like if we were to move back to the States, I don't want to say we'd be forced to live in the suburbs. No one would hold a gun to our heads. But it'd be a much more difficult choice for us to live in the earth. You see, I would... There would come with a burden that doesn't exist in Paris or London or Toronto or Amsterdam. So I think in America, this idea of what would it take to make family friendly cities is that's the conversation we need to have. If not, we're going to end up with cities for the young mm -hmm. and, you know, that want to have fun and get a good job and go out at night and the empty nesters. And then in the, the middle of your life, when you have kids, not because you want to, because it's hard, you're going to move to the suburbs. And I think that's a big challenge for American cities. Richard, what are we going to be talking about in terms of cities in 10 years? What are we going to, what's going to be the discussion? Well, I think there are going to be a couple things. You know, the one we didn't talk about, which I think this summer we're talking about, is climate change. Now, I'm not an expert in climate change. This is not my thing. But when the sky turns orange in Toronto and New York City, and Canada is on fire, and that smoke drifts all over the northern part of the United States. When Phoenix is over 110 degrees for how many days? When the water temperature in Miami is over 100. When there are super storms, this is a couple of years ago, that hit my hometown of Newark and New York City, super hurricanes. Yeah, and I mean, the fact of the matter is, I'm not an expert in this, but I know enough to know that most of the world's great cities, Miami, New York, the great Chinese cities are all exposed there because the great cities tended to grow up around natural ports and harbors. So that's number one. I think we're going to be talking about unaffordability. I think the fact that my dad could buy a house with a seventh grade education, worked in a factory, and it was a nice little house in New Jersey outside of Newark and raised his two boys, me and my brother Robert there. You know, I don't know. I have a house and I bought it. Well, I bought my first house 30 years ago. But if I didn't have a house, I don't know if I could buy a house. And, you know, I'm teaching MBA students in a great MBA program and they're going, I don't know if I can buy a house. So I think the unaffordability problem that was once a problem of New York and San Francisco and L.A. and then caught up to Miami and Nashville and Austin and all those Sunbelt places, you know, maybe the Midwest has some afford. But, you know, if you look at the fastest rising housing prices now, it's like Detroit and Cleveland. Because mm -hmm. people are smart. They're going, I can work remotely. I want to live in a house. So, And I'm an American. I kind of have to live in a house. So I think affordability, I think inequity for sure is going to be an issue, a bigger issue. And I think it's not just inequity like we think. I mean, look, it's horrible that we have a, areas of concentrated poverty. But I think this oligarchic class, I don't know what else you'd call them. The fact that there's such a small group of people that are capturing all the rewards and, and look, I, I hate, it's what made me an urbanist, seeing poverty in my town of Newark. But I think what happens is when young college educated kids and their parents, after they work so hard all the way through elementary and high school and, and school and university, and they can't get a job and afford a house, I think that's the powder keg, folks. I, I mean, look, I, I think it's all terrible. But when you kind of clamp down on people who worked really hard and expect more and are politically engaged. So, yeah, I think climate change, affordability and inequity, those are going to be big, big, big issues. And they're not going away. I, unfortunately, I think they're going to be bigger issues and they're going to register in the political scene. I think our, these are the issues that are going to be the and Zoe and folks like, look, let's do a historical lesson. My dad was born in 1921. My mom was born in 1926. What happened a century ago? There was the Spanish flu. There was World War I. There was the Roaring Twenties. We're living in the Roaring Twenty Twenties. What comes after the Roaring Twenties, folks? After the big party and everyone, not just the Great Depression, but a period of introspection about what kind of country we want to be, and then the war. And then people said, no, no, no. Those union workers in Newark and Detroit and Pittsburgh, they deserve a job, a good job. Black people, they deserve rights. Uh, they, deserve, they deserve civil rights. 
Uh, women, yes, they have the right, but they women need a movement that makes sure that they have equivalent rights in the workplace and in the economy and in politics. I think the reckoning's coming. Uh, you know, America may seem, my daddy always told me this, Richard, you know, seventh grade education is incredible. Richard, America looks like it's lazy. And when I signed up for World War II, they gave me a broomstick and a doughboy helmet. You should see how fast this country can turn. And I lived through it. So I have no doubt that as these issues register, Americans will, will shed their complacency and say, look, we want a better society and we want a new kind of middle class. And we want cities that work for more than just the super rich. And, and yeah, I, I don't have any doubt that we're living through the equivalent of the Roaring Twenties. And that was a period just like this of dumbing down and complacency and, you know, right wing populism and we'll get there, but it's, it's going to take us a bit. It's going to take us a bit and we're not at, at the end of the tunnel now. Oof, I cannot wait to talk to you then in 10 years and look back <laughs> and go, oh my gosh, this is all happening. Okay. Yeah, I think it'll be better. I mean, look, there's so much doomy, gloomy stuff. Like yeah. the arc of history is better folks. And, and I don't mean to be like Pollyanna here. If you just take this one simple thing, everybody used to have to work on farms to make a living and it was backbreaking work and it was horrible and people lived to like 30. And then we had the industrial revolution where we agriculture became so efficient, we could work in factories and people killed themselves, but life started to get longer and longer. Now we don't have to work on farms as hard. We've robotized it. Now that, that and people have lost jobs and it's awful. But now the further development of our society really depends with artificial intelligence and all of this on the further development of human creative capabilities, like engaging people in doing new things. You're not going to develop society unless we engage more of people's creative capabilities. These, this thing, which is intrinsically human. Yeah, that has to point us eventually to a better world. And, and we have to grapple with lots of things. And, and if resistance and struggle make us better, we got a lot of stuff to struggle against. But I have no doubt in 10 years we'll be out in a better in a better place. We are talking on PBS books. You want to do a quick lightning round about all things books? I'm terrified. Okay. What are you reading right now? Um well, that's really interesting. I just ordered a book on the it's so funny. I just ordered a book on the Newark riots because it's the anniversary of the riots. It isn't called The War at Home. I forget the name of it, but it's a book about these photographs uh, from Life magazine. And, and of course, you know, I continue to read everything ever written on pandemics and cities. I'm reading a book, a really nerdy book here, um, about a bunch of, of really, really smart people criticizing me, like doing all this mathematical models to say how wrong I was. And I like that because it makes me a bigger person. Yeah, and not so much, unfortunately. Oh, sorry. Uh, a lot of children's books. My kids are six and seven. So okay. yeah, we're out of wheels on the bus, but we're into, you know, Bob and his beak and, and a bunch of uh, kids' books. So I read like two or three kids' books a night. Um, recommend a book for someone who is just now, after watching this, incredibly interested in the future of cities or urbanism and what does it mean to be an urbanist recommend a book or should I, they start? i'll recommend three please the, i would start with jane jacobs the economy of cities and if you want a deeper study in that go to her initial book the death and life of great american cities uh i i would read ed glazer's book triumph of the city and if you really want to improve your sleep for a month you could read my, my book rise of the creative class um, so those those would be the ones. And there, there are many others that are quite good. And finally, PBS book. So I got to ask, what's your favorite library? Oh, that's easy. Oh, there's two. This is really heartfelt. I mean, there was a great little library when I was a kid. Like, I I love books. If If I live in a world of guitars and books. You should see my library, folks, at the University of Toronto. It's like the whole floor of our building. So... I love books. The North Arlington Public Library, when I was a little boy on the corner where I could first, and they were like Hardy Boys, you know, uh, after Dr. Zeus, it was Hardy Boys and all of that, the Green Lantern. And then, you know, a credit to my mom and dad, because they knew I had my seventh grade education. Mom had a high school education. 
my dad would take me to the Newark Public Library. No bigger, no bigger impact on my life than the Newark Public Library. Uh, I would, that's how I learned to be an urbanist. I would walk those shelves. Believe this is a nerdy little kid, and I had Coke bottle glasses because I got glasses when I was two. And I would go search those shelves and pull books off on the Great Society program in the 1960s and the riots way before I went to university. So the library changed my life. There, there, folks, there's no doubt about this. Like this is truth, heart. Those libraries made me who I am. And then one last thing, you know, when I was 17, the state of New Jersey had a scholarship they called the Garden State Scholarship. And I applied for it and I got it, which meant you could go to any state's supported university. And had I not gotten that scholarship, it's almost, there's a high certainty I would have lived the life more Sopranos-like. You know, that's a, a show that was filmed not far. The opening scene is my hometown. The ability to go live away at a university and extract myself from that peer group that was surrounding me. And, and then the Rutgers Library, so, yeah. And that's one of the things I miss. Like, I haven't been to the library in a long time because I have this thing in front of me, you know, this computer where I can Google anything. I think the library is the single most fundamentally transformative thing in my life, especially growing up. Not I don't want to say poor, but working class. So we didn't have a lot of books in the house. And we know this. The number of books around a child has a lot of influence on how that child develops up and develops their cognitive skills. So yeah, library was really important to me. And without the library, I wouldn't be who I am. Richard, Florida, it is always a pleasure. Thank you. It's a, it's a delight. I better get my butt to the library. I'm going to say go renew that library card. Mm -hmm. So we thank you so much for guiding this conversation. It was so much fun to be able to listen and hear Richard's extraordinary insights and thoughts and learn more about his background. And as we're at this pivotal moment to be able to learn a little bit from the expert. So this has been really wonderful and we look forward to being, being able to hear more. For those of you out there, just remember the rise of the creative class and the new urban crisis. There are two of Richard Florida's outstanding books. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla and happy reading.